Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us for an update on Arizona's response to COVID-19. Since we last briefed you, Arizona's made significant progress towards implementing measures to increase capacity in our healthcare system, build PPE supplies and critical resources, and reduce the strain on distribution chain for our local grocers. We've also seen firsthand the impact of COVID-19 with two Arizona lives lost to this virus. Our hearts go out to them and their families. It's a sobering indication of what we will likely continue to face. The sad reality is, just like the rest of the country, we expect more deaths. And as we work to increase testing capacity, we expect more confirmed cases. But we aren't standing by idle. We're working around the clock 24-7. Health professionals, education leaders, workforce policy experts, the public sector, the private sector, the National Guard, operations, and logistical strategists, doing all we can to minimize the spread and maximize our fight against this deadly virus. We're making progress, and we want to share the latest with you today. Now, our actions to date have been on March 11th, I declared a public health emergency. And in our efforts to reduce the spread and flatten the curve, last week I issued an executive order prohibiting dine-in services at restaurants and bars and closing movie theaters and gyms. We've worked closely with Superintendent of Public Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, to securely close our schools with a priority to minimize the impacts on our students and teachers. And to keep our seniors safe and healthy, we took a step to ensure they limited their exposure, delaying expiration dates on driver's licenses so our elderly population doesn't have to visit the MVD. We've halted in-person visitation in state prisons at the Arizona Department of Corrections, Recidivism and Reentry, and expanded telework for employees across state government with exceptions for critical positions like our corrections officers, state troopers, and DCS caseworkers. At the Department of Economic Security, we've pledged to continue payment to child care providers during this difficult time, enabling continued care and alleviating the cost burden for low-income families during these uncertain times. At Access, we've received approval on an 1135 waiver from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid services to protect against any disruption of care for its members during this public health emergency. We've taken aggressive action to preserve medical supplies and PPE by suspending elective surgeries to free up vital resources. Gloves, gowns, masks, and ventilators, increasing capacity in our health care system. And we've activated the Arizona National Guard to provide relief in our food distribution change, stocking shelves in our grocery stores, and allowing Arizonans to have reliable access to food and resources and fill their pantry, pantries and refrigerators responsibly. We're working hand in hand with the federal government through the CDC, NIH, HHS, and FEMA. This morning, I joined a video teleconference with Vice President Pence, administration officials, leaders uh, in the federal government, and uh, uh, subject matter experts, and the state's governors, where they indicated additional guidance will be provided by the CDC later today. This weekend, I was on site for the delivery of our state share of the strategic national supplies we had ordered and they were delivered this weekend. Arizona was the first in our FEMA region to receive this much needed inventory. I'm grateful to everyone on site for their assistance in breaking down the resources for distribution across all 15 of our counties and to those who need it most with priority. It was an overwhelming amount of resources, but still it's not enough. As we've seen, commercial partners are looking to build capacity for testing, with Banner Health standing up four drive-through testing sites today and more to come. To guarantee our public health experts get the data they need to accurately model the spread and plan ahead, 
Today I'm issuing an executive order for enhanced surveillance requiring commercial labs to provide laboratory specimens for in-depth analysis and sequencing. It will also require commercial labs to provide denominator data on their testing, something that to this point has been provided voluntarily by our commercial lab partners. For more on COVID-19 cases in Arizona, updates on testing, resources, and healthcare capacity, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Kara Crest. Doctor. Thank you, Governor. Across the country and the world, we've seen the devastating impacts this virus has on our communities. And in Arizona, we're faced with the all too real reminder that COVID-19 is a highly contagious, serious, and in some cases, fatal disease. Here are the latest figures related to COVID-19 in Arizona. Today, we have 234 cases in 11 counties throughout the state. There are 139 cases in Maricopa County, 25 in Navajo, 24 in Pima, 17 in Pinal, 17 in Coconino, three in Yavapai, four in Apache, two in Graham, one in Yuma, one in Cochise, and one in Santa Cruz. Tragically, we've seen two lives lost to COVID-19 and our deepest sympathy is with the families and friends of these Arizonans. Over the last few weeks, we've continued to see the numbers climb and we expect greater increases moving forward. Arizona has community spread of COVID-19 and as testing capacity increases, we know we will find more cases. We've taken aggressive action to follow CDC guidance to combat the spread, including the governor's executive order to prohibit dine-in service and close all bars, movie theaters, and gyms in areas of community spread. While testing capacity has increased, we continue to face the national shortage of testing supplies and reagents. At this time, there simply aren't enough tests for everyone who wants one, so we continue to prioritize our high-risk populations. To be clear, testing will not change your treatment. It will have, if you have mild flu-like symptoms, stay home when you are sick and for 72 hours after your symptoms go away. Seek emergency care if you have extreme difficulty breathing, constant pain or pressure in your chest, severe constant dizziness, or other serious concerning or worsening symptoms. Our work with commercial partners to expand testing availability is still ongoing. Under a standing order that I've issued for the state, commercial partners like Banner are st standing up drive-through testing facilities. As Governor Ducey detailed, we've made a number of steps designed to decrease the spread. And I'd now like to provide you with details on what we're doing to increase capacity in our healthcare system. In addition to the governor's executive order, halting elective surgeries in an effort to preserve personal protective equipment, ventilators, and other critical medical resources, we're working around the clock to secure resources in our hospitals. In the last few days alone, we took in a portion of the state's strategic national stockpile, including 244,000 surgical masks, 60,995 masks, 50,000 latex gloves, 26,208 face shields, 22,000 surgical gowns, and other critical resources. And we've already placed the order for the next portion of Arizona's strategic national stockpile supplies. On Saturday, our request to HHS for 5,000 ventilators moved towards the next step of approval. And earlier today, the FDA released guidance to safely convert anesthesiology devices used in outpatient procedures to ventilators that can effectively treat those infected with COVID-19. We're engaging in a statewide survey of our ambulatory surgical centers to identify these devices and build overall capacity of ventilators and PPE. Over the weekend, we've been working with private and commercial partners to secure up to 2 million N95 masks, 1 million surgical masks, and 1 million surgical gowns, with 260,000 of these N95s anticipated to be in Arizona next week. We're exploring temporary waivers with the medical board to allow retired physicians to be quickly relicensed, 
This will help us build capacity in telemedicine to reduce our exposures in hospitals and healthcare facilities. And we're implementing measures for EMT professionals to reduce hospital burden, including screening measures and the ability to provide expanded services to those in need. In terms of hospital resources, we must continue to increase our bed capacity. Currently, there are 16,905 licensed hospital beds in Arizona and 1,532 ICU licensed beds. The estimated need is rapidly evolving as we gather new data with a potential surge of COVID-19 patients above and beyond our current capacity of beds. The governor's executive order to implement enhanced surveillance for information related to COVID-19 will assist greatly, providing awareness of our hospital capacity and surge, allowing us to get denominator data on commercial laboratory testing and collect laboratory specimens to do further analysis and sequencing. Arizona has a plan for increasing our healthcare capacity, and we will continue working with hospitals to identify ways to increase their internal capacity, including the use of triage tents outside of emergency departments, utilizing hospital rooms, recovery areas, and other unused portions of hospitals to provide additional beds, and working with hospitals on any waiver requests they may need in order to increase their internal capacity. We're also working on utilizing alternate care sites to provide additional capacity beyond the hospital, including reactivating pre-existing hospital sites such as St. Luke's Hospital, Core Institute Specialty Hospital, and Scottsdale Liberty Hospital to add beds. Utilizing non-traditional facilities such as ambulatory surgical centers and respiratory training facilities to provide additional ICU care and using large venues such as the Coliseum to provide step down or recovery care for those who are ready to leave the hospital but unable to go home. And we're working with DEMA to request additional federal resources, including three field hospitals, two for Phoenix and one for Tucson. These efforts are just a fraction of the work put in by my team at the Health Emergency Operations Center and the support from Wendy Smith-Reeve and the team at the State Emergency Operations Center to build capacity in our healthcare system. As a public health professional, I want to take a moment to address the very real mental health impacts our citizens face in light of these recent events. Whether it's nutritional impacts for our children who are out of school, the fear in our high-risk populations, and the anxiety of those who just miss hugging their parents and grandparents. It's important that we not mistake the responsible practice of social distancing to mean encouragement of emotional distancing and isolation. Remember, everyone deals with stress and anxiety differently. During these difficult times, everyone could use a little extra compassion and kindness. And finally, I know some of you chuckle as I repeat these lines, but they really are so important to ensure we reduce the spread in Arizona. Wash your hands often with soap and water or used an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. And if you are sick, please stay home. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue and immediately throw that tissue in the trash. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. And if you need to see a healthcare provider, consider using telemedicine. Stay home whenever possible and avoid crowds of 10 or more people. It is best to keep six feet between you and others when you are in public. Avoid social visits, shopping trips, and discretionary travel. Do not visit nursing homes or long-term care facilities unless you are providing critical assistance and practice social distancing everywhere. With that, I'll hand it back to Governor Ducey. Thank you, Dr. Chris, for the work you and your team have done to preserve public health and prepare for what's to come. I also want to say a big thank you and shout out to Wendy Smith-Reeve uh, with the Division of Emergency Management and General Mick McGuire with the Arizona National Guard. I'm grateful for their commitment and leadership and the work of your dedicated teams working together to combat COVID-19. Many of you have asked if or when the state will move towards a stay-at-home policy. The answer is not at this time. 
we're following the facts related specifically to the state of Arizona. The CDC isn't there yet. Arizona is not there yet. We're not at the same stage as other states. And today on a call with the state's governors from around the country, the vice president made it clear there have been no discussions about a nationwide lockdown by the president's coronavirus task force. As I travel around the state, it's obvious that citizens around the state are already staying at home and acting responsibly. There's empty streets and empty sidewalks and traffic-free highways. But we all know the risks. The virus is most harmful to those we love the most, our grandparents and our parents. All of us should heed the advice of public health officials. These are unprecedented times, and our approach has been to proceed with a calm and steady manner and with a sense of urgency and to provide certainty wherever possible. To that end, today I'm issuing another executive order for the employers, families, and citizens across the state that details what are essential services. Again, we are not implementing a so-called shelter-in-place policy as other states have done. This is a proactive and administrative measure that ensures that the state has one consistent overarching policy that is based on CDC and public health guidance so that the people of Arizona across all jurisdictions, cities and counties have clarity and consistency. It's my hope that we stop the spread, protect our economy and mitigate the need for further action. But this order will allow workers and employers to responsibly plan for what things look like in the weeks ahead. We've had to make some tough decisions, decisions designed to protect public health, decisions that have been tough for our workforce, small business owners, and families. I want to thank all Arizonans for their cooperation during this time. We know this is creating economic challenges and they are ones that we will be addressing in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Our commitment to Arizona is twofold, protecting public health and our economy. We're all in on both. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. So uh, our focus has been first and, and foremost on the urgency of this issue on COVID-19 uh, with a framework of let's do everything possible to, to stop the spread, to uh, avoid Arizonans contracting this disease. Uh, secondly, for those that have it, those that are infected, we want them to have the proper care, we want them to have the proper comfort. We want us to have the proper hospital uh, capacity that's necessary. Uh, third, we're focused on those that are on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, the emergency medical responders, the first responders, that they have the protection. That's the gloves, the gowns, the, the masks, the, the PPE. Um, and we care about the people that are being affected that are living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that is an, an overwhelming concern of what we're doing. I applaud our legislature uh, operating in a bipartisan fashion to get dollars to the governor's office. We're also working uh, on an economic uh, protection plan. Uh, it's 14 pages long right now. Uh, we worked on it all, all weekend, and uh, that's going to be for a, a press conference in, in the very near future. Like I said, the priority and focus, first and foremost, has been public health, but we also realize what's going on in the economy, and we know we need to address that. Well, let me just quick follow up to that point. If you have people who are evicted from their homes and living on the streets, you're actually complicating the public health problem. It seems like we need immediate action now to keep people who are right now coming up on having their mortgages due, having their rent due. What are we doing right now? 
we're going to have more to follow on what we're doing. The $50 million that the, uh, th that the legislature put forward is going to allow us to, to work with the most vulnerable. Uh, it's our intention, and we will be stretching and strengthening the safety net of, of the state. And uh, I'm hopeful that the, uh, the United States Congress can pass the legislation that's on, on their desk. I think it's, it's disgraceful what's happening in Washington, D.C. And I don't know how any United States senator could justify voting against that package. I'm proud of what's happening here. I'll applaud the bipartisan leadership that we've had, Charlene Fernandez, David Bradley, Rusty Bowers, and Karen Fan. You've seen what Kathy Hoffman has done uh, regarding schools and what Katie Hobbs has done so uh, we could allow democracy to function. That's how we'll continue to operate in Arizona. Um, as we look at the PPE and evaluate the, the state's needs, um, that strategic sto national stockpile is should be out in our counties today. They will be able to provide um, the PPE, the masks, and the gowns that we got um, over the weekend to our, our county health departments and our communities. Um, that still won't be enough. That's why we were looking and working with those private public partnerships and the uh, and our community. Um, partners to identify rapid ways that we could get additional masks. And so that is one of those things that to get 260,000 masks um, here next week, um, that was quite, quite an accomplishment. And so we're very excited about that, but we will continue to look for additional PPE so and to request. Private sector steps in and works with you to get up to the yes, so the private sector should also be uh, looking for avenues and how to supply the PPE within their facilities and we will support by trying to identify that from a state and federal level as well. JJ, uh, Governor, you just wrote a letter to the Defense Secretary um, saying you, you anticipate meeting a few defense group members of the Guard and they'll be involved in um, law enforcement building hospital tents. Um, we heard from you last week that Well, the, the, the mission of the National Guard is to help the state in its times of, of greatest need, depending on what the, the governor uh, determines or directs. Uh, last week, uh, and, and I think still this week, it was in replenishing our grocery stores. Uh, we have a supply chain that's working. Uh, it typically takes two stores to restock a grocery store. Uh, at this time last week, it was 12 trucks to replenish a, a grocery store. We wanted to surge the guard to be the last mile to get those uh, shelves re replenished. Uh, they're not going to be grocery store workers. They, they were going to the, close the gap in terms of uh, what was missing in that last piece of it. Now the grocery stores are hiring. Uh, we're going to employ the guard as needed. Uh, you heard Dr. Chris talk about the health care needs that we have around temporary hospitals, uh, et, et cetera. So they're going to be flexible. Uh, they're the best uh, at what they do, uh, and I'm grateful for what they do. I also want to say regarding uh, our grocery stores and, and, and our grocers that have been working so hard and the people inside our grocery stores that have been uh, scrubbing and, and cleaning and replenishing these shelves. Uh, these employers are hiring uh, at this time. And if you're, you're going to go shopping, uh, buy a week's worth of groceries uh, once a week. If you'll do that, you can come back the next week and the, the, the shelves will, will be full. Is the Guard involved in law enforcement? Will they be involved in law enforcement? The Guard right now is involved in replenishing our grocery stores. Response on how you are doing it, and when will you be more aggressive 
Well, I, I want to thank Arizonans for their cooperation. Uh, we have, through executive order, of course, shut down all dine-in uh, business that's been going on, encourage uh, takeout. We've put the executive orders as necessary with the guidance of CDC and the Arizona Department of Health Services. That's what's going to continue to guide uh, our direction. Uh, this is, like I said last week, this is something we should think of as a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we see what's happening in other places. We're focused on the state of Arizona, what our number of cases are, what our level of spread and risk is, and we're putting the appropriate restrictions at that time, uh, and we will continue to escalate as necessary. You still have some businesses like Intel and Chandler with 400 people getting together to eat at a lunch table. You have parks, though. We've, we've, we've issued guidance. Uh, we uh, want people to social distance. I, I think a, a better way to think of that is a, to physically distance. I was with Dr. Bobby Robbins of the U of A uh, last week, and he said, you know, you want to be at least an arm length away. That's not quite six feet, but you're, you increase your level of, of safety. So we're in, we want people to do that. I, what I've seen is uh, a lot of people being responsible. Uh, see people taking this more seriously and understanding the issue and uh, we're going to continue to do that and like I said use the executive orders and the powers of, of the governor's office appropriately. Dennis, So what, what our, our thinking is going to be on, on the economic package that we put forward is we want to focus on the most vulnerable and those that have been displaced because of, of this virus um, and the shutdowns that have happened around this virus. So the focus is going to be on, on individuals. It's going to be on small and, and medium businesses. We're going to be con we're, we expect large businesses to be part of the solution. And uh, in a time like this, when you have uh, this cliff and immediate recession that we are facing, uh, it's the ongoing payments uh, that, that are most burdensome for, for people. And that's what we want to address. And when I have more specifics on how we're going to do that and the totality of the package, uh, you, you, you will know. The, like I said, the first focus has been public health to date, and that's been something that has been all hands on deck. And we're working at the state level, and we'll be working in partnership at the federal level. We're certainly working with the administration, uh, with the Secretary of the Treasury. And now if the U.S. Senate could do the right thing and get this passed, we, we, we would have some clarity as to what the federal and state combination would be. Well, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Christ. Uh, 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 well, listen, I think that any of these deaths around this uh, infectious disease are, are, are tragic. Um, I want to see everyone have the ability to, to get a test, certainly those that are symptomatic uh, and sick and have the conditions of the, the, the gentleman that, that, that passed uh, because he did have underlying health conditions that he, sh he should have access to that. Dr. Christ has uh, addressed what we're doing around these tests, how we've expanded our testing capability, how we have four uh, areas and locations right now uh, for drive-through testing, and we're grateful to Banner uh, for, for doing that. Um, and beyond that, I, I wanna say that uh, the people that are most vulnerable uh, for, for the worst uh, 
outcomes with this disease are, are those of a certain age category with underlying health d diseases. That's why we're saying to people in that most vulnerable category to stay at home. If you're sick, stay at home. Uh, if, if you do, you know, have to, to leave, it should be for, for uh, well, you shouldn't leave. You should be getting someone to help you out on, on some of the essentials, and we'll continue to repeat that. How, how, again, how, how does this happen? Because we hear stories of people being denied all the time for tests, and they, are, they do have symptoms, and here's somebody. We have expanded our, our, our so testing. Yeah, couldn't get a test. We've been told by the president, if you want a test, you can get a test. There are millions of tests. Well, we're, we've been very, uh, we've told you what the facts are. In, in the state of Arizona, uh, where we were on testing and how we have expanded testing and how we will continue to expand testing. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confident in, in what we've shared with you and uh, uh, the direction that we are headed in. Uh, there is a surge uh, of need for all of these things from testing uh, to hospital capacity to personal protective equipment. We've been able to uh, address each component of it and improve it. Uh, somebody said when you have what you need, I don't think there will be a point in time right now where we'll check a box and say that we have what we need. It will be what will we, what will we need? What more will we need? How do we anticipate what those are? That's what I've been working with Dr. Christ and Health Services every morning is let's share with, with the people in a, in a timely and transparent way where we are, what we need to get to, and all the actions that we're taking, both the government and the private sector, to solve the problem. I asked this question last week, I'll ask it again today. The mayor of Yuma says, we don't have any tests. Mojave County, hardly any tests. Yavapai County. Hardly any tests. I think I heard you say we got focused on urban areas, but how do you leave rural Arizona out of this? We're not leaving rural Arizona out of this. We are going to the places where we have the, the highest spread, the the most number of, of cases. Uh, and just like the, the pictures that you saw from this weekend, of course, in, in Maricopa County, the size of the pallet is going to be much larger because of the population of Maricopa County. But we have 15 counties in the state of Arizona. We had personal protective equipment going out to all 15 counties, and we're going to address testing the same way. Kara, do you want to talk on the, uh, yes? Yes. So um, to go back to the initial question, um, Bram, about the, about the patient. Yeah. So I don't want to Monday mor morning quarterback any physician in our community because they are all doing what they can during this outbreak. Um, however, a test result, whether it was positive or negative, should not have changed that individual's clinical treatment. Um, should have been discharged from an urgent care and I have not reviewed the care, but with instructions that if you develop shortness of breath, if your fever worsens, if your symptoms worsen, you should return to healthcare to get further evaluated. I am assuming that the individual was not in need of hospitalization when they were at the urgent care or had signs or symptoms that would have prompted that physician to refer them and admit them to the hospital. So it's hard to say, but they should have, whether it was flu, whether it was metanuma, whether it was corona, they should have been treated the same and their symptoms should have been managed. Going on to the testing, we do know that commercial testing is taking part in all parts of the state. So um, we're reviewing where those uh, lab tests are being ordered commercially. Um, we are seeing them in Kingman and Yuma, Yuma and other parts of the state. If a public health department is contacted by a physician who they believe that they have really a high risk patient, we will get them the supplies that they need to test that patient. We send it from the state lab to their health department. We're going to Telemundo and then yeah. Fox 10, then we'll come back. Dr. Chris, uh, yes. of those who tested positive, is there a number of the ones that have recovered? And are, is there enough test kits to test everybody? So there are not enough test kits right now to test everybody who would like to be tested. We're prioritizing those high-risk patients and then patients with symptoms. Um, and out of those patients with symptoms, prioritizing those hospitalized patients. Um, I don't have the figures because so many of the labs now are coming in through uh, the commercial labs. I don't have their current status or follow-up. shelter in place order. You say that Arizona's not there yet. 
without tests, how does Arizona, we don't know where we are. How can we make such a huge decision with such a huge lack of information? Linda, th thank you. And, and what I want to do is everything I can to uh, alleviate people's fear and concerns. I know that the anxiety is out there and it's very real. Uh, there is testing going on. We need additional testing going on. Okay. And I, I am following the guidance of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have been hand in glove and in lockstep since March 11th and will continue to be that way. I think you want someone who is surrounding themselves with subject matter experts and listening. And that's what I'm gonna to continue to do to make the right decisions for the state of Arizona, which is in a different situation than other states. Peter, and then Nicole, yeah. What, what businesses are essential and non-essential in this point? And how will you be outlining them in your executive order coming up? You'll see the, in the executive order. The executive order will, will be going out. We, uh, we looked, of course, at CDC recommendations, public health, and there, uh, we are watching what's happening around the country. Um, some other states are in a much different position uh, well before Arizona uh, is in that position. So we're trying to apply best practices and any learning so that we can lower the spread, uh, lessen the, the, the consequences, and we've done the same thing with this executive order. So not yet, but no timelines to when this list of businesses will be released? Yes, it's gonna be this afternoon. And it's not a list of businesses. This is a proactive and administrative step. It's what I it's what I said it was. It's proactive and, and administrative. It's to provide clarity. It's it's so that people uh, in in these situations can plan ahead. Uh, like I said, we're going to hope for the best, but we're 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 going to prepare for for potential uh, escalation of this, and that's what this is. So with the executive orders that were placed last week with um, closing dine-in options, bars, um, movie theaters, those and gyms, um, that will slow the spread. We will see decreased spread. We encourage everyone to stay at home to assist with that decreasing that spread. What we will continue to do is monitor and identify. So we haven't fully moved to a mitigation strategy. Our county health departments are focusing their research or their resources on containment at high risk areas. So if we have a case that might potentially, and I'm just giving an example because I don't, I don't have any on my head, but if we had a case in a nursing home, that county health department would be full on containment in that nursing home to try to prevent spread there. Some of the community spread, we are at a mitigation level. And so to follow every single one of those cases is just not going to make sense from a public health standpoint. So one, you guys won't be sending people out to notify people anymore because the case number is growing. It, it would depend. It would depend on um, the situation of that individual and if they are in potential uh, contact with high risk individuals. So. Older inmates, uh, to sort of reduce the population 
So I want to say that I have uh, uh, confidence in, in Director Shin and the plan that he's put forward for our departments of correction, uh, rehabilitation, and, and reentry. This is a, a concern that we have. Uh, we do not want to see the spread of, of COVID-19 uh, or reduce or avoid the spread wherever possible. We've, of course, restricted visitations. We've setting up uh, tele televisits uh, that, that we can have. Uh, we're making sure there's temperature testing uh, for our correctional officers who, of course, come into the facilities and then leave the facilities. And then we're also working with the, uh, the in inmates that work off-site from the prison so that they can uh, be protected and, and not bring spread back to the prisons. That's where we are on that issue to date. I am I'm, I'm working with guidance from CDC and the Department of Health Services. When, when an executive order is issued or a declaration is made, it's made from the governor. I am listening to the subject matter experts. I'm listening to the public health officials, all 15 of which I've been in alignment with the entire time, Dr. Kara Christ and the, the leaders in our federal departments of Centers of Disease Control and National Institute for Health. That's, that's been guiding Arizona's direction. What about with transparency and releasing cities that these people live in, more data that we can get, maybe those areas of people will be like, this is in my city, maybe it will. We're giving, we're being as transparent. Uh, you can go to the azhealth.gov website and as we have new statistics and figures, they're posted daily. We're following best practices, and like I said, I'm, I'm working with Dr. Kara Crest on this. One more from Brandt. Uh, your friend Bill Gates of Maricopa County has provided a lot of details as well. Perhaps other counties can do the same. But we're all for it. We're, we're for more information and more data. Here's a question, a uh, different kind of question. Families, many parents who share custody are finding right now that one or the other spouse won't follow uh, the court order and hand over a child. Is that something you could provide guidance on? Who should provide guidance on that to parents with that kind of well, care? Uh, all, all Arizonans should follow the law and court orders all of the time, especially at a time like this of public health crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.